Hello everybody and thank you for joining me here for my second episode of my Mongolian adventures. So I am going to be talking all tonight, well not all, probably about uh, 30 minutes or less, <laughs> of um, basically anything, all I did was uh, the Nandam, uh, dressing up in costumes, which is my favorite, uh, thieves, I Yes, I've got a bunch of stuff stolen here, and as well as the accommodations that I stayed in. Now, if you have any questions, please put them down into the comments below, and I will get to them. Next week, um, I'll be going into Mongolia Part 3 out of 4. Um, next week, I'm going to be talking all about the tribes, the rides, and the vibes. So this is going to be about my stay with the reindeer tribes, the nomadic reindeer tribes here, as well as all the beautiful landscape and the photos of that landscape, as well as all the different things that that I rode, which would be horses, camels, and reindeers. We're going to jump right in first with Nandam. Nandam is the festival that um, is done every single year in Mongolia in July. Now it is, um, there are different times that it is. The main one, which is in Ulaanbaatar, that one usually is about the second week um, of July. Uh, I did not go to that one. Um, I went to the more local ones, and they have local ones throughout the whole month of July, just depending on where you are. I was told um, by people that actually live there, as well as some other people um, and blogs, that to actually get photos of the events and really get in there, uh, going to the one in Ulaanbaatar is not where you want to be because it's in a stadium um, you're not going to be able to get like a press pass or anything like that to get down onto the field so you're going to be you know quite way up high whereas the ones locally they are you're sitting right on the ground right outside uh, where they're um, happening now this is my group from my 15 day tour um, this was us arriving in Nandam now Nandam has a very um, uh, sort of like a fair type atmosphere here. So people come um, as vendors, you have food areas, you have um, people that you see this scene quite a bit over there too. Uh, just people riding their motorcycles all across the the steppe and the, the landscape. You also have people on horseback, um, all dressed in their um, traditional um, clothing. Now this is what it looks like around the wrestling ring. Um, it's just jam-packed. Wrestling is the most popular. Now, this little girl, she would, she saw me taking photos of the wrestlers, and she, I have a whole series of her just creeping further and further into my photos, so she was then standing right in front of the camera. But she was just super cute, uh, wanting to have her photo taken. Now, there's three events that happen at Nandam. Um, there's horse riding, there's archery and then there's wrestling. Now horse riding was one of my favorites. Um, horse riding, the jockeys, as you can see here, uh, they are kids. So kids anywhere from five years old to probably the latest that they're gonna ride is maybe 13. Uh, so basically what they're looking for is the lightest possible people to be on these horses. Now these horses are going like Mach 5. Uh, they're Full out riding them. A lot of them ride bareback. Um, kids usually get on a horse between two and five years old. Uh, so they are very well versed in how to ride horses and how to handle horses. Uh, the categories here are split into different categories. So it's not as in um, it's the horse's age, not the actual kid's age. So they'll have like two-year-old horses, um, then they'll have stallions, and then they'll have seven-year-olds. Um, there's the, sometimes can be different ages within that, but those are usually the basic ages. Now, girls and boys can also participate in this um, horse racing. Uh, you don't see as many girls as boys, but you do see the odd girl, so I'd always cheer for her. <laughs> Um, but it's also a very long race. Now, the races will be anywhere, depending on the age of the horse, anywhere from uh, 10 to 26 kilometers long. Like, you didn't even realize that the horse racing was going on until you heard through the 
um, the crowd that the, it had started because you don't even see them starting and then you're watching wrestling or you're having something to eat and then through the crowd again you hear okay they're coming up they're coming up coming up so everyone races down to where the opening is of where kind of where they're going to be coming in and they just fly by and it's just so interesting to watch um, again winners they they crown you know the top five um, on each class and it is just a really, really cool event. And to see such young kids um, participating in it. Now, the next thing is archery. Um, archery is probably the least popular um, out of the three events. Uh, I don't know why. I think it's really cool. But you don't find as many people doing the archery. Um, the Where we were, there wasn't very many people doing it. Both men and women do it. Um, but they do it separately. And... So the women's, it's a distance target. Um, the women's target is at 60 meters. The men's is at 75. Now, they do have to wear the traditional outfits, which are called Dells. And you see on her wrist um, that there's a little tie. So they're usually required to use the tie on, the, um, on their outfits so it doesn't get in the way of the, the shooting. Now, it's just really beautiful and uh you know obviously some people don't think it's as interesting i thought it, i thought everything was really interesting um but it was just really beautiful to see everyone in their coordinated outfits and how they actually did everything now the biggest draw um here is wrestling um wrestling here is a way of life uh the ones that win in the in ulaanbaatar in the big one in the stadium they're known throughout Mongolia it, this is so big it's like their Olympics every year uh, they're so big they, they have trading cards of the winners and people know who the winners are so it is a big deal now there's this guy here so every um, person every wrestler has one of these guys now these guys are called the encouragers now, they can encourage you for two reasons. One is to hurry the heck up and do something. And the other is to give them motivation saying, yeah, you're doing really great. And the way that they do this is they smack their, um, their wrestler on the butt. So there is a lot of butt smacking. <laughs> you just can't help but giggle every time <laughs> the encourager would smack the butt. But it was very, very funny. Um, and then you have the outfits. So these are traditional outfits. Uh, you got the, the, the tidy shorts. Um, you know, they do ride up. <laughs> and then they have those um, vests as well, plus the boots. And then they also have the hat. And the hat gets taken off, obviously, when they start wrestling. Uh, now, the, the way that the, the vests are is because wrestling is a man-only sport. Women are not allowed. So traditionally, those outfits were done that way. So no women could sneak in and wrestle. <laughs> Definitely will know that. Now, with these ones, um, you can... They also have these ones here, like where they tie across, so um, they can hold on. So they can either grab onto like the shorts, or they can grab onto the rope around their waist. Because everywhere else is hard to to grab onto. I just like to point out the two guys in the back on the horses with the full ensemble coordinated. Uh, you see this all the time at this festival and you know sometimes in town as well where they're coordinated and then their like boy, their husband or wife is coordinated in the exact same thing as well i just thought it was super cute but the wrestling two things here there is no weight class so you get drawn two people and you have to wrestle that person this guy was not so lucky <laughs> because he was so little compared to this guy um but it was you see some good throwdowns. You see, um, you know, some really good action. But to tell you the truth, it is like kind of watching really bad high school fights. Um, you know, where you go really hard and for about 20 seconds and then you realize you're 
don't have that much endurance and then you just kind of huddle there <laughs> and you just kind of catch your breath and that's where the encourager comes in so um, when they come out they have to do an eagle dance um, and kind of to, to thank the judges and thank you know everything around and then there is no time limit again where the encourager comes in and there is usually, well, where we were, there was three wrestling matches going on at once. So there was a big field, and it was just three people going on at once. They had a judges at one end, and I guess they'd be watching all three. Plus, then they have the encouragers. Now, the winner is crowned when the other opponent gets the other person on the ground, um, any, any part of their body touching, except for their hands or their feet. So any time that they go down, they touch the ground, that's when the other person is crowned. Now, one of the cutest things that happened uh, during this is the kids doing the wrestling. And they're just <laughs> cute as a button. But my favorite part, because I'm a little, <laughs> a little mean, uh, you know, they're doing all their stretches. They're doing their eagle dance. They have such joy and hopes on their faces. And they're so excited to be a part of the man down. And then they go wrestling and they give it their all. And it lasts a couple seconds. One goes down. And then they start crying when they don't win. <laughs> I can't help but laugh because they're just so upset some of them have to be carried off by their mom uh, but it is the cutest thing and oh just the upset is just tragic now those are the three things that happen at Nandam highly recommend it one of the things that did happen to me at Nandam was I got my bag stolen and freaking nightmare um I had put it down, I tried to participate in one of these archery things and put it down beside me and did the archery, looked down, gone. So we looked all around and it it had everything in it. It had my wallet, it had my passport, it had all my cam like my camera gear that I wasn't carrying separately and it was just annoying and upsetting. I only cried a tiny bit, but I didn't let it get to me. Um, because there's nothing I can do. We looked all over. We contacted the police. Um, one thing you want to make sure of is you want to contact um, the consulate and your insurance as quickly as possible. Get your credit cards um, definitely uh, cancelled as fast as possible. Now, this is hard enough in a place where there's lots of telephones. When you're in the middle of nowhere, very difficult. I didn't really know exactly what I needed to do because I was kind of in a daze. Uh, luckily, we stayed at a hostel this night, uh, which it was unusual for the tour. And uh, one of the guys that was staying in the hospital hostel was um, someone that worked at the Canadian consulate. <laughs> so I was able to ask him questions. He gave me the number. I called, reported it, and there was nothing I can do until I got back into Ulaanbaatar. So I called my mom. And she canceled my credit cards for me. I called my insurance policy, told them what happened. Um, and I knew that I needed to get a police report within 48 hours of it happening. Sometimes they're 24 hours. It was impossible. Well, it was really hard. I was on my guides the whole, like, for the full two days that we were there to get a police report. And they police kept pushing them off, saying they're, they're too busy. They don't have time to write a police report. Um, I was on them lately because I knew I wouldn't be able to get anything back if I did not have that police report and we were leaving in two days to carry on with our tour. So finally able to get a police report written all in Mongolia. I basically told him exactly what to write <laughs> and he just wrote it in Mongolian and then um, I had that translated by my insurance company. Uh, when I got back to Ulaanbaatar, um, look at this, I got to go to the consulate. <laughs> So, got to the consulate, started the process. It was a long and horrible process. Getting all your passport photos, getting everything, um, supporting everything for a new passport. Um, they, I took pictures of everything because I wanted to confirm with my insurance policy that I had done everything and I just wasn't, just proof. I want to have proof of everything. Uh, so, I was taking pictures of where I was getting my passport photos done. Um, and everything else. In the end, ta-da! I got a temporary passport while in Mongolia. It did. I had to uh, change my flights um, for to stay longer in Mongolia, 
and I finally got this and then when I got to Thailand which was my next country I was um, to pick up my uh, actual new passport there since they don't do passports in Mongolia it had to be sent out to Beijing so it was a process and then coming home and when I got home putting everything into the claim is another nightmare and I still lost a ton of money and um, because obviously they don't cover everything and they don't cover cash and you know I had a lot of camera gear so it is what it is um, things happen on on your trip sometimes out of your control and you just gotta let it go and move on now I didn't let it ruin my trip um, I was determined to love Mongolia and I really did even if that did happen now one of the things that um, you do is when you go outside of Ulaanbaatar, obviously you got hotels and hostels and everything. Like they even have the Shang Shangri-La in Ulaanbaatar. But once you're outside, you're going to be staying in Gurs mostly. Now Gurs, not yurts. They look the same, very similar, um, but they are not called gur They are not called yurts here. So don't make the mistake. Now they are just everywhere. This is like a, the resort, um, a resort area. This was where the hot tubs or the um, hot springs were. So all the white ones are the little huts for everybody to stay in and then the brown houses on the side where where the um, the hot tubs were. Um, again our horse riding camp um, this was sort of like a like a campsite a little bit. This was in the central. Uh, mostly like when you go to Gurs and, and stuff like that the people that are living in their Gurs they will always almost have um, a satellite dish. So you'll see a satellite dish there. You'll also see um, solar panels uh, to help with lighting and, and stuff like that. Now they are like little hobbit doors. <laughs> so um, it is like a little hobbit door in the beginning um, but you do can stand up uh, in them and sometimes at certain places depending on where you are you are staying in the girls. It's almost like an Airbnb and in the houses that's where the family lives. So they're just renting out their gurs um, to tourists and uh, to people, locals that are traveling. Um, you also never know what's going to show up at, at the doors when you're visiting the families. Um, we had like a baby goat come visit us. Um, this is the inside of the gurs. I was quite happily surprised when we first went in them is that we got beds. I was fully prepared for sleeping on the floor. We had sleeping bags and um, and that, but not all of them had pillows, so I was glad that I had my pillow. Uh, some of them were more fancy than others. Some of them had carpet inside or fur on the ground. Um, all of them had fire stoves to keep warm because it did get quite chilly in the evenings. You never know what you're going to be sitting beside. Now this was inside the um, our host's skirt. And you're going to always find something drying out. Um, and especially when it's right beside their toothbrush and toothpaste. <laughs> I couldn't get over it. But um, someone asked, did it smell? Didn't smell at all. No smell whatsoever. This was the most homey gur that we went into. Uh, it just felt like they're, they'd set up their home and, and that. So it was really quite beautiful. Again, you're always served uh, milk tea and some treats. Um, that's part of my second group that I was on tour with. Now the other type of accommodation that I stayed in was teepees. Now teepees I stayed with um, when I was in the reindeer tribes. Now they use these for their summer camps uh, just because they're a lot easier to transport but they are really quite cool. Uh, no beds in these ones. Uh, they are on the floor. Sometimes they have a ground cover. We Half of ours had ground cover, half of it didn't. But we had our sleeping bags and you just put on all your clothes and I wrap my head in my scarf just so no creepy crawlies get in there. Uh, and they're just in the middle of nowhere. They just kind of pop up randomly and you don't really see too many around. This was the inside again of um, a wooden stove uh, up here because we we're more north. It got quite cold uh, like definitely around zero or, or minus possibly in the morning and overnight so our guides would uh, one of one of them would stay in per night and just keep the stove and uh, the fire going each all night so we didn't wake up freezing this is what your view is uh, while you're lying down so that's the top of the the teepee uh, inside of the host teepee um, a little bit 
more carpet and a little bit more homey. Um, and people are always visiting. So whenever you pass by a gur or a teepee, um, you're always welcome to come in and, and say hello. There's always going to be people in there. These were just another uh, bunch of people that were just passing by and they came in at the same time as us. And again, you never know what you're going to be <laughs> seen hanging about while you're in the gur. So lots of different things to look at while you're sitting in there. Cause, especially because you can't com have a conversation with them because no one speaks English. You can do like a little bit of a conversation through your guide, um, but mostly you just sit there staring at each other, <laughs> which is kind of weird. Now, another thing that I we liked to do was uh, we went to the black market. Now, the black market is in Ulaanbaatar. Um, we were prepared this time because we knew that uh, the black market was uh, definitely a place for thieves and a place for pickpockets. We came across um, someone actually trying to pickpocket this woman's purse. Um, one of the guys in our group actually um, screamed at her, um, so she left and didn't get anything. But it, again, it's people that have the purses that are not don't have a zipper in your hands just easily to get in there. Don't bring those on holiday. Don't bring those around, especially when you're going to markets. You want to have those zipped up. Now, I did, you can buy all sorts of stuff here, and you just want to kind of buy everything. Um, I did pass up on the hat. Um, kind of regret it, but I did end up buying those boots. So, I did have a, um, a love affair with some of the, the outfits that the women wore. Uh, they're just super beautiful. I personally like the middle one the best, uh, but... As I was, you know, picturing, sending these photos back home, you know, Amy was like, you're never going to wear it back home. And she was right. So I didn't end up buying that. So boots and a, and a ball cap that was eventually lost anyways uh, was what I had bought. Now, dressing up was unexpected here. Now, this was at the Nandam. And when I saw this, I'm like, oh, my God, I need to dress up. So... I went over and two other people from our tour group um, also came with me and I just got the tour guides to take pictures and of course I wanted to stand beside the camel and I was just happy that I was able to button those up because sometimes they're just, I'm a little too big for some of the small uh, small sizes but very regal and I was like oh my god this is so much fun I thought that was the end of it well it wasn't <laughs> Now, this one, I was definitely channeling uh, the uh, Queen of Naboo from Star Wars. This was at one of the biggest uh, monasteries in, in Mongolia. It was big, and then outside the monastery was um, some vendors and some shops and whatnot, and you could dress up. So I was the only one that dressed up on, my, on this tour, um, so I totally took advantage of it. And these outfits were killer comfortable they may be tight up top like around around the boob area but as soon as it comes out it just flows and you can just let your stomach hang out it was fabulous so the, the first photo is me directing my tour guide how to take the photo and where I want the photo taken now then I took a, my second tour also went to the same monastery and so I knew that I was going to be able to get dressed up again now this time I was able to wrangle a few more people to get dressed up and I knew exactly where to go and what I wanted to wear um, first I had picked out I always want the tallest hat around I picked out this one but then it looked like Marge Simpson so I traded it and for the red one to go with my outfit so there was five of us that got dressed up and we had a whole photo shoot going on. Now, us over on the right-hand side, we were discussing um, what our next uh, photo was going to look like and how we were going to pose, <laughs> just planning everything out. Well, we had no idea that they were fighting over on the other side. Then we did a whole photo shoot. Um, the one on me on the right, that is also one of my guides. Uh, and then we obviously had to stand in front of the... Um, the monument in the monastery and uh, entrance and stuff of course looking very regal then I found a, another opportunity where I could dress up now this was when we took a little so there was a few of us that took a little side trip in Ulaanbaatar um, while we had some, a break in between tours 
and we went out to go see the giant Genghis Khan out there. And in there, you were able, there was an area to dress up. Now, I already knew that I had like the more regal outfits, so I decided that I really wanted to dress up in winter gear this time. So I was, again, the only person that dressed up. I think they thought I was ridiculous. But I wrangled one of the guys that we were with to come follow me and uh, take my picture everywhere. Now, I had one in my gur, and then I had one by my tapestry, and then one, of course, just lounging on the couch. And then lastly, I had one by my giant boot. <laughs> this one's my favorite. Um, so, yeah, it was just so much fun. Now, you've got to seek out these kind of unique experiences when you're there. Look for these funny and interesting things. Now, that was the end of today. Squeezed it right in there. Uh, this is how you find me. There's my websites, Instagram, Facebook, and email. Again, um, if you also want to download, I've made a free um, vacation planning workbook, so you can download that there. I hope you guys enjoyed tonight. So I hope you guys have a wonderful evening, and I will see you next week. Talk to you later. Bye!